you to everyone for joining us. Before diving into the main topic today too far, I would like to begin with a brief introduction of Wyatt technology and the fundamentals of the instruments highlighted throughout this webinar. The Wyatt portfolio covers a large breadth of application areas from things such as peptides, conjugated proteins, viral vectors, polymers, and more through our light scattering instruments. Wyatt also offers a unique separation technology called field flow fractionation or AF4. And this is great for situations when standard chromatography methods cannot be applied successfully. And here at Wyatt, we are a scientifically driven company whose main goal is to delight our customers. And for those of you who are new to light scattering, please do visit our website at wyatt.com to learn more about solutions, products, and resources on light scattering. As a researcher, we are interested in studying a particular molecule for a variety of different reasons. And to study this, we may want to identify some key biophysical properties, such as molecular weight, size, conformation, composition, and understand our molecule's native state in solution without needing to alter the sample. And after we have identified these properties, we ask, is my protein or biopolymer in solution exhibiting the desired properties to proceed with further research? Does my sample contain aggregates, fragments, or other impurities that can lead to wrong results or incorrect uh, conclusions? Have we learned anything new or unexpected from our light scattering experiments today? Often, these questions are addressed using some separation techniques, such as with gels or SDS page. But for more precise and quantitative analysis, conventional size exclusion chromatography is typically used. This technique is most often referred to as SEC-UV or GPCRI. And SEC is going to separate and identify molecules according to their size only. So larger molecules will spend less time in the column and elute earlier, while the smaller molecules will traverse the pores more and get retained and elute later. And to begin generating this assay, SEC data is collected with a series of known molecular weight standards, such as a globular protein or linear polymer, for example. And these standard peaks are then measured by a single detector, such as a UV or RI detector. And the elution time of these standards are then plotted against their known molecular weight to generate a column calibration curve shown here on the right. Now, to measure the molar mass of our sample, the elution time of the analyte is going to then be compared and fit to the column calibration curve we just generated from the previous step. Please note that the column calibration curve will always have a steady and downward slope, indicating that molecules which elute later will always have a lower molecular weight. However, this is not always true, and there are several pitfalls and assumptions in the column calibration technique that can lead to incorrect results. SEC alone requires some assumptions to determine your molar mass. One has to assume that our sample has the same conformation as the column calibration standards and therefore will have the same relationship between size and molecular weight. For example, when you calibrate using a globular protein, we're assuming that our sample is also an unmodified globular protein. When we calibrate with a linear polymer, we're also assuming that our polymer has no branching uh, of any kind. And since SEC elution is based on hydrodynamic volume and not molecular weight, if our molecule has a different conformation than those standards, it will have a different relationship between molar mass and size compared to the column calibration curve results from the last step. This will lead to incorrect conclusions about your sample's molar mass. Column calibration will also assume ideal and purely steric column interactions. Molecules that interact with the stationary phase are non-ideal. For example, any electrostatic or hydrophobic interactions will elute later than expected based on their size alone. Here too, conventional calibration will provide an inaccurate molar mass. Column agent and day-to-day -day pump variations can also cause the chromatography system to have poor reproducibility and slight shifts in retention time. And these challenges can produce errors in the analysis. 
what is the likelihood that all of our assumptions apply completely to your molecules and standards? As we will see, light scattering can address these weak assumptions by directly and accurately measuring molar mass using first principle calculations without the need for a column calibration or shape assumptions of any kind. When we add multi-angle light scattering detection to our SCC methods, we no longer need to run column calibration. So at that point, SCC is only going to be used to separate our individual species so we can characterize them one at a time as they pass through our light scattering detector. Light scattering will determine your molar mass directly and independently of elution time. It does not follow any of the assumptions we previously spoke about in the last slide. In addition, light scattering can determine the size of our molecules, and in combination with the molecular weight, we can learn more about their conformation. Another benefit of MALS is the ability to characterize samples for which reference standards do not exist, such as pegylated proteins, membrane proteins in lipid envelopes, branched polymers, copolymers, and so many more. For all these type of analytes, SEC MALS will provide the absolute characterization and overcome the in inherent limitations and errors associated with SEC UV or GPC RI methods. Wide instruments are able to achieve molecular weight determination through exploiting two basic principles of static light scattering. As your sample passes through your MOS flow cell, it's going to be polarized by an incident beam at a single wavelength and intensity. And since light scatters with the most intensity in the plane perpendicular to the incident beam, each photodiode is positioned to take advantage of that around the outside of your flow cell. And the first property that will measure is the absolute molar mass of the molecule or particle. And this is proportional to the total intensity of scattered light and its concentration. We call this the absolute molar mass because the measurement does not require calibration with any known molar mass standards. Furthermore, the measurement is going to be independent of your sample shape or conformation. The second property that can be measured with light scattering is the size of the molecule or particle itself. The variation of light scattering intensity at each measured angle is going to be directly related to the physical radius of your sample in solution and wavelength of the incident beam used. The variation in the intensity as a function of angle allows us to determine the mean square radius of the sample and further enhance our understanding of the sample size and shape in solution. Without MALS, when we compare multiple UV signal traces, there's nothing really inherent in the peaks that tell us if our sample is homogeneous or polydispersed. One looks a little more narrow, one's a bit broader, but according to SEC column calibration methods, the molecular weight must vary across the peak as it elutes. However, when we add MALS to this data, we can determine the molecular weight distribution independently of their elution properties. And in fact, SEC MALS proves that the left peak is homogeneous and the right peak is polydispersed across an order of magnitude and molecular weight difference. Add in this third UV signal shown here on the right, and we can see there are two distinct peaks, one possibly smaller and one possibly an aggregate. By using SEC MALS, we can analyze the molecular weight of each peak independently and properly identify what's eluding in our sample. mRNA is particularly tricky to characterize. These molecules tend to form tertiary structures that make it difficult to characterize using calibration standards that match them. To make matters more challenging, mRNA are prone to degradation, and the degraded products may not necessarily always elute as distinct peaks. By adding MALS to your SEC method, this will allow you to uh, look under the hood, as I like to say, at your eluded peaks and determine if the mRNA's molecular weight is different than what you expect in any way. By adding multi-angle light scanner detectors, this will tackle many of these challenges head-on for us. And as a result, we can get more information in a single run 
including information on aggregation, degradation products, and their molar masses. The table below here lists biophysical parameters measured by the online malls and DLS. Some of these include things such as molecular weight, aggregate content, radius of gyration from malls, and hydrodynamic radius from the online DLS. Adding dynamic light scattering will allow us to obtain both the RMS radius and hydrodynamic radius in a single run, and this can be used to reveal more detailed structural information. You can find details about this and more from our application notes located at wyatt.com.